Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Guy Dornsey and this is a presentation I gave to a number of young people a while back called Utopia, the Remedy for Apocalypse. Um, it's, a, it's a good hour's talk but I guarantee you'll enjoy it. So put your chair up and, or go on and put it on pause and go and get a cup of coffee ready to get started because it's a lot of fun. Um, this is me. My name is Guy Dornsey. I live on Vancouver Island in the far west of Canada. And in order to do these um, webinars turned into a YouTube video, I have my friend Bruce McKenzie on the right-hand side helping me. And this is the kind of another sense of me, the way I live. I pledge to live, work, and act in a loving, respectful way towards this earth that I call home and towards all who live upon it, every insect, animal, fish, bird, plant, human, and tree. And I do a lot of work with the BC Sustainable Energy Association. So a lot of my writing is there, and a lot of my activities in the world are through the BC SEA. So let's get started. We've come a long way since the original beginning of creation, up to 14 billion years ago. Planet Earth got created around four to five billion years ago. The whole of evolution has happened, this incredible process of creating. Our ancestors all lived in a version of this, you know, a couple of hundred thousand years ago. And now look what we've done. That's the journey we've made. We're, we're on the edges of going into space with incredible, sophisticated high technology. But we've also come to this. Basically, the trashing of our planet with, with pollution, with garbage, with toxic chemicals, with overconsumption, and the stuff I'll go into briefly. That's a forest quite near to where I live here on Vancouver Island. And the sort of grief that comes with the fact that that's what we're doing to our natural world. This can't be the way to live. There's something wrong with us living this way. We need to find a better way of doing things. We've got to get beyond this instant consumerism, a shop therefore I am. If everyone lived the way wealthy people do on this planet, we need three more planets to provide the resources that we're consuming. Gross domestic product, which is the way that economic progress is measured, is actually you know, the, the thing on the, that's the altar of all activity, but really, I mean, we used to celebrate things like this. It stands for gross depletion of the planet. We're tearing down the rainforest. Why are we doing it? To raise cattle to make hamburgers. More gross depletion of the planet. Why are we doing it? To make palm oil, to make pizza, or to make shark fin soup which tastes like nothing. It's just done to show off how worthy you are in China. And then even while, as we're carving up the planet, you know, there's gross economic inequity and injustice happening as well. And meanwhile, we're just pouring out the carbon emissions that result from fossil fuels. We have a climate emergency resulting from our unrestrained use of coal, oil, and gas, those ancient fossil fuels. When we burn those fossil fuels, that's what it does to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it's putting us on a rise for a rapid fever and severe problems. It's a thousand tons a second of fossil fuels, carbon dioxide, being produced from coal, oil, and gas. Every second, a thousand tons. And when we look at the, the era of stable temperature for lasting 10,000 years, and the sudden overnight upshoot in, in temperature, and where we're going, it's enough to sort of give you that real sinking feeling in your belly and then the knowledge that something has to change. That's why the People's Climate March was held in September of this year, where 400,000 people got out to express their determination to change our future, to not go down the road to apocalypse, but to explore the potential for utopia instead. We've lost 80% of the Arctic sea ice. We're seeing many more dramatic floods and storms and situations like this. Stuff that used to happen every 100 years that's now happening every 10 years. Forest fires getting totally out of control. And the last time the world was three degrees warmer, the global sea level was up to 25 meters higher. That's an historical fact, not a projection. That's Vancouver with just a three meter sea level rise. So you can see it's like total devastation. You can't build a seawall four meters high to protect all that land. And we also are dealing with extremes of poverty and social injustice and homelessness and inequity um, 
and the knowledge that you know the one percent are running away with the planet and the ninety nine percent are getting left behind so there's a double crisis there's a huge environmental crisis and a huge social crisis growing up you know it can't be right that greed is good but we look at the growing inequity you know the, the bottom line along the bottom there of the the bottom twenty percent have seen basically no increase in average household income before taxes for the last 35 years, whereas the top 10% are roaring up. If you look at the average ratio of, of workers to CEOs, back in 1982, it was like 42 to 1. So the CEO earned 42 times more than an average worker. By 1992, it was 200 times to 1. By 2000, 282. By 2012, 354 times. So in one day, a CEO is earning what an average worker takes a whole year to earn. And there's a real sense that the greed of the elite is stealing our future. And this fear that there's another crash coming because of the way we have not resolved the issues of the banks of the world and the financing globally. And this, this, we've got to somehow find ways creatively to respond to these crises. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. That's the way you know negativity looks at all this. So it can seem overwhelming. We've got a climate crisis, an oceans crisis, financial crisis, hunger, poverty, war. But it can feel overwhelming, and it's easy to understand why a teenager would produce a piece of art like this in in the Vancouver region. In the past, the theme of apocalypse has come up often. Um, the, the sense that the world was ending often associated with with the great comet coming round. This is like probably in the early 1600s. And the sense of gloom and doom and foreboding, you know, bolstered by the book of a book of um, apocrypha in the Bible that is, talks about the end of the world. So there's always been lurking on the edge of civilization a fear that everything's going to collapse and, and, and come to chaos. And we see that being repeated today. This is an artwork expressing today's civilization. You know, there's the Statue of Liberty and what happens when apocalypse strikes. And there's there's a whole set of thinking that says, you know, the world's going to collapse, we cannot possibly sustain the overconsumption, over the craziness of the world, and that's what it's going to look like in the future. Um, look at the bottom left-hand corner, we're back to hunting for that tiger. And other people's fear is more prosaic, it's simply that, you know, the world's going to run out, how do I get around? And then we have the, in 2012, the fear that the Mayan calendar was prophesying the end of the world, and you know, the current world might be destroyed, and maybe something new will be born out of it. Maybe there's a golden lining in all this. Um, but it's not a healthy way to go. There's, there's a much better way to go in the mind than getting caught up in this kind of darkness. It's, it's really not good for our mental health, and it stops us being good activists to change the world. So when we look out at the future of the world, when you ponder our planet, what do you feel? Now, I, I do this as a live talk you know, in classes with, with students, and I have them come up to the blackboard and put a tick at whether they feel excitement, hope, uncertainty, worry, or fear. So I invite you now to put a mental tick in which of these boxes and make a note of it. What do you feel? When you tune into the future of the world, what do you feel? And now I want to change track and show that another world is possible. And from now onwards, it's going to be you know, powerfully good news, I hope so that we can actually change our artistic visualization of the planetary future that we're, we're trying to build through major change. We have two possible futures. One that is more pollution, more oil spills, more deforestation, and the other one that expresses hope and beauty and renewable energy. Hope sees the invisible, it feels the intangible, and it achieves the impossible. That's what we have to do. And a lot of stuff that we live with today was previously seen as impossible. So what is the probable future of our world? A lot of really bad things. But what is the possible future of our world? A lot of really great and amazing things. And what makes the difference? Quite simply, you do, I do, and we do together. Because nothing is changing in this world that one of those three groups didn't do. You, I, or we together. So let me sort of take another little sidetrack here and ask, are you conscious? You probably accept that you're conscious, but how much further does it go? Do you believe you have free will to choose your future? When I do these things in a class, I actually have people lining up on either side of the room and moving. Like, whether you believe you have free will or whether you believe everything's determined. And there's a lot of 
major scientific discussion about that very issue. Is there purpose and direction in the universe? Or is it all just random? There's a, a good topic for an evening discussion. What is this universe that we live in? Where's it going? What's it about? And what's our part in it? So we all need a story to make sense of the universe we live in. It's very tough to have live without any kind of explanation. And so I've got four possible stories here. There's one is that there is spiritual purpose in life. There's meaning and direction. We may not know what it is, but if we, we keep on working and believing, we'll maybe find out. Second story says, like, who knows, but it's really amazing. I, I'm just existentially blown away by the creativity of the universe. I can't begin to understand it, but I'm amazed and wonder at it. A lot of scientists feel that way. The third explanation is that nature is good and beautiful, but humans are bad. Humans are messing up. Humans are causing the trouble. If we can only let nature you know, be undisturbed by humans, everything could be good again. And the fourth simply says, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. So there's the four stories. I mean, this is, I can't tell what, how you're responding when you're listening to this, but most of us fall into one of those categories. We're, mo but we're motivated as humans by dreams of life and wholeness, not by nightmares of death and collapse. Whenever we choose to do something bright and positive, to start a business, to start a, non a non-profit, to plan a holiday, we're not, on the whole, dreaming of the worst thing that could happen. We're, we're powerfully motivated by that vision of what's possible. And we have the freedom to choose. So what kind of future are we projecting? Will our young people see the future on the right here and go into terminal despair or see the future on the left and then want to use their whole life to create utopia instead of falling into the black hole of apocalypse? Which path will you take? There's plenty of room on that left-hand path to truth, justice, and wisdom. So I'm going to also do a bypass to a quick history lesson, which I th believe strengthens the case for the, the pitch that I'm making on behalf of Utopia. If you go back 100 years to the time of your great-grandparents, you can strip off. There's no Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, mobile phones, internet, credit cards, space travel, computers, TV, recorded music, airplanes, antibiotics, relativity theory, women having the vote, all gone. And if you live in a tribal society, you're probably living much the same way 100 years ago as you did today. Go back 500 years, which is only 20 generations, and now we've got no radio telephones, no light bulbs, no periodic table, no electricity railways, etc. No democracy, no freedom from slavery, no idea of tolerance and equality, no telescopes, no idea of science, all gone. Go back 5,000 years, and now we have no printing press, no algebra, no geometry, no alphabet, no literature, all gone. And 50,000 years ago, no agricultural cities, musical instruments, all gone. So it raises, in 50,000 years, that's what we've achieved. So it raises these massive big questions with this incredible progress of some kind that we're creating, what's it all about? You know, what comes out of this thing called the Big Bang, that all of this evolutionary spiral that's ended up creating us? It is really amazing when you go back into deep time and arrive at the present. And so it's, these are our ancestors, every one of us, by the fact that we're alive today, has an unbroken genetic descendants from the primates and then from all life before them. It was the, pri our, the early humans' quest for knowledge that led the way to the Neolithic age and the first use of stone tools. It was the quest of the people in the, in the Neolithic age and their work and their spirals and their lining of, of temples with the rising sun and the summer solstice that led the way to Babylonian thought. That, in turn, led the way to Egyptian thought, which led the way to Greek science and philosophy, which led to Islamic science and philosophy, which led to the Renaissance and the rediscovery of ancient science and thinking. That led to the scientific revolution. And that led to the Industrial Age and the very first use of fossil fuels to sort of create you know, massive machinery. That led to more Industrial Age, which led to today's world. So, we are the descendants of all that process of creative thinking going right back to before the Neolithic. You know, our ability to use a cell phone to basically phone up someone in a space station comes out of that unbroken strand of thinking going right back to before the Neolithic. And again, it's also come to our trashing the planet. 
So this journey of civilization has seven threads. We've learned during those last 50,000 years, we've learned how to communicate, how to relate to spirit, and all these things. And so learning how to communicate, we had to develop speech, writing the alphabet, manuscripts, run away all the way through to the internet. These are all specific steps of progress that we've made as humans. We've learned how to relate to spirit and hopefully how to become tolerant of the many different ways of understanding the role of spirit on the planet, whether it's through music, through Christianity, through the Muslim faith, through Buddhism, through atheism. They're all similar ways as we quest to understand what spirit is. We've learned how to create technology from the very first stone arrowhead right through to the nanotube and the bucky tube, all a result of human thinking as individuals and as teams working together. It's quite amazing when you look at that journey. We've learned how to think scientifically, starting with the Islamic scientists working through Copernicus, Galileo, and then up to Stephen Hawking, using observation to develop a theory, to develop predictions, to test by experiment, then to observe again and to, to get rid of superstition and irrationality and craziness so we, we build a very solid platform of knowledge which is always open-ended because we're always learning and there's always more that we don't know than we do know but we're learning. We've also learned how to cooperate and make social progress as for instance in the 18th, campaign, 18th century campaign to abolish the slave trade leading to the abolition of slavery. Now we are learning how to live in harmony with nature. That is the challenge of the current century, because we're certainly not doing it right now, but a lot of people are really getting engaged with this new learning. And we're learning how to end war. It might surprise you, but actually we are being very successful over the centuries in, in reducing warfare, in reducing um, brutality, state violence, and civil war, and learning the technology and the techniques of nonviolence, of intermediation, of peacemaking, and peacekeeping. A lot of it due to the United Nations and to this, the, the, the protest movements against war. Back in the 19th century, we, we struggled to build democracy, working together to overcome the power of tyrants and kings and, and dictators and warlords. We struggled to achieve workers' rights, to, where the, 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 one of the goals of the early workers' movements was an 80-hour working week instead of a 100-hour working week. Just think about it. We successfully campaigned to end child slavery. Now we still have child labor around other parts of the world, but we know it's wrong, we know it needs to end. But it used to be that children worked down the coal mines, worked in the factories, and died early deaths from all that you know, pollution of their lungs and early exhaustion. It used to be that women weren't even thought about as being part of politics, and so we had a whole movement to win the vote for women. It's, um, frankly, it's more of a 20th century campaign. It came to fruition in the 20th century. Canada, I believe, did not get the vote for women until the year 2019. And we had to struggle against Nazism and fascism, uniting together and organizing together to overcome the brutality of people who unite around a, a narrow-minded, selfish, nationalistic cause to oppress everyone else, whether Jewish, gypsy, gay, or whatever. In the 20th century also, we learned the power of nonviolence, and, and that India achieved its independence through the struggle for nonviolence. There was no civil war, there were no explosions, there was no fighting. India achieved its independence through organized, disciplined nonviolence. And the same goes for the civil rights movement in the century and the freedom of South Africa, all because we organized together to overcome great difficulty. And then all coming out of utopian vision, what we believe we can achieve on this planet. Now we have this struggle to have harmony with nature, to basically move away from fossil fuels, to move away from the exploitation of our oceans, of our soil, of our forests, of our species, of our creatures, of our fish, of our farm creatures. Manala Yousafi is, is showing how a young woman can lead the struggle for women's rights coming out of Afghanistan. And we still have an ongoing struggle for democracy. This is Ukraine and there are other places in the world. It's Hong Kong today as I give this talk. And we have a continuing struggle for economic justice to overcome, to transcend beyond pure unregulated capitalism and build a cooperative global economy. So when I take the same crises that seem to be overwhelming in the past, and we can line them up and see the response. The response to the climate crisis is climate activism. The response to the financial crisis is the new economy activism. All the way through, 
There are activists working, committing their lives, using their careers, earning money at it to make this world a better place. There's not a realm of difficulty that's not got people working at it to make a difference as activists. There are activists working as lawyers, even as judges, um, as economists, as architects, as engineers, as biologists. And who will do all this? You and me, earning a living at it, getting our professional skills to do this stuff. We can all make a difference in the world. We haven't just got to be out on the street protesting. We can do it through the work that we do in our lives. The power of our vision must be stronger than the power of our fears. That's the fundamental message that makes the difference between utopia and apocalypse. And then the Roosevelt, um, married to the, the president of the USA in the past, said the future belongs to those who believe in the future of their dreams. Because we have the power that attracts people to want to join us. People want to be confident, not to be fearful. So what is our vision, our vision of a beautiful, desirable future? Or rather, what are people already creating towards that vision? to show that, yes, a better world is possible, and that we can do it. We're looking at a metamorphosis here, you know, as we transform from, from the caterpillar into the chrysalis and into the butterfly. And if you're searching for the one person who could change your life, all you have to do is take a look in the mirror, because it's you yourself who has the greatest power to change your life. Life it is, isn't about changing or finding yourself, it's about creating yourself. That's how we find ourselves, by going and finding what are our passions, what do we love about life, and then getting on with it and making it happen. And embracing change. Nothing that we love in this world would have happened without change by our previous ancestors and forefathers. And if we sit down and do nothing, we're basically being lazy slobs. So let's get up and make change ourselves. If she can do it, we can all do it. This young man is a teenager, he was 14, and built a windmill in a tiny rural village in Malawi. Just using common sense, he did not have access to the internet. He just puzzled it together. Then I believe they took him over to Harvard and tried to sort of teach him some really good stuff. This 18-year-old from Holland was really concerned about the massive ocean of plastic that's floating in the ocean, turning into tiny bits and pieces, so you get these great Pacific garbage gyres. And he put his mind into it, and he got raised funds, and he got support, and he's come up with one possible solution which you can find about on his website. He's got financing and engineers working on it to actually find a way to gather up the plastic off the ocean and harvest it using the tides of the ocean to sort of drive the plastic into that kind of boom that he's creating. But I'm really getting at not about the solution, but, what, what, but about what one 18-year-old can do. Here's the transformation of a simple set of boring gray concrete steps. And that captures the sense that the world can change. Now it's become a great place for meeting, for gathering, and by the looks of it, texting and phone messaging all the time, but never mind. <laughs> and bringing nature back into the city. It may not be the wolf and the bear right in the heart of the city, but there's a lot of change coming up. In Vancouver, lost creeks buried, buried under concrete are gradually being unearthed and restored and turned into places of beauty, such as this, where the salmon are coming back up the creek after 80 years of being shut out. This boring, gray transit station in Surrey, near Vancouver, got a workover from a company called Green Over Gray. And that's what they did to it. That's the kind of transformation that is happening in the world today. This um, guy from Paris, Patrick Blanc, is making a whole specialized career out of it um, in turning the walls of buildings into the Mur Vegetal. And there's the Eiffel Tower in the background, so this is Paris, right? And that's the heart of London. And so our city is going to begin to blossom with greenery in a quite unexpected way. And with greenery comes birds, comes butterflies, comes deep breathing and a sense of joy and beauty. And then we go further. This is Vincent Kayabal, um looking at potential architecture out in China. And they will be building things of this kind. That's for sure. Concrete, boring schoolyard. Our cities are full of schoolyards like this. But look what trans how this schoolyard in Brooklyn, New York, got transformed into that. The parents raised money, I haven't been, you know, and they got it done. It's possible everywhere. We, schools can start growing their own food, so the kids learn about, you know, you know how, what is in a melon, what's in a squash. There are books on how to green our school, school grounds. There's no excuse for not doing all this stuff. Our school, our school grounds, instead of being concrete, can be, look, woven willow, bamboo. They can be homemade cob houses. They can be incredible play structures like this. 
And they can be crazy wild play structures like that that really gives the freedom for kids to explore and make things themselves instead of that boring, dull concrete. We can reimagine streets. So that would have been a regular three-lane street, but now it's being reclaimed by pedestrians. A street like this can become that. Streets in the cities, and our cities are full of regular streets like that. They can be calmed and reclaimed and become this. Dangerous streets with four or five lanes of traffic there altogether you know, can become slower and calmer and safer like this. And, you know, I think I've shown you that one already, so I think I may have a doubling up here. Yeah, in Portland, um, neighbors are getting together and reclaiming ordinary intersections because they want a place for neighbors to meet to create a heart for the village. So City Repair has been leading, you know, the initiative to show what's possible. So neighbors say, hey, this is our neighborhood. Look what we can do together as we celebrate living here. And then bring out the tables. A whole block can get together and organize a block party so that we're rediscovering neighborhood and friendship. The, frankly, the way we lived in every village throughout humanity, on every land, throughout history, until the last 50 years or so, when the motor car started taking over and making it not safe to wander on the road as pedestrians. And the term jaywalking got invented to turn walking into a crime. And bringing in community art so that our cities become funky, quirky, fun, different places to live in that you can't help but laugh. And, and feel happy. This is right here in Victoria, where I lived 25 years, where neighbors you know, had a boring concrete wall and they got an artist out and had fun with it. This um, down in Colombia, it's not just in North America and Europe this is happening. This is a dull street that's been transformed again in Colombia. Again, the neighbors are reclaiming this. The cars are still got a place to go. This is on um, a pedestrian street in Buenos Aires. And, and it brings back art, it brings back people, it brings back beauty. In the heart of Seoul in South Korea, this used to be like how many lanes of traffic have we got there? About 15. And underneath that, there is a creek or a stream that used to run. So uh, only 10, 12 years ago, the city said, let's restore the creek and bring it back. And so they brought it back looking like that. And today it looks like this. And it right, runs through the heart of the city and people just love it for commuting, for walking, for having lunch, for hanging out, for artwork, for expression, for protesting. This is when there was a protest to, to free the Arctic um, 30 who were trying to up in Russian waters to stop Russia from drilling for oil in the Arctic and then got arrested. And this protest is in the heart of South Korea where the highway used to be. This is the converted railway in New York City that used to be rusty old iron and then is now the most loved new park in New York, the High Line. And this is an artist's version of what we could do to the land under the Brooklyn Street Bridge. If transport can be much more by cycling, by, by transit, by, by car sharing, we don't need to have cars everywhere. This is a bridge across the River Thames in London that was proposed by the architect Thomas Heatherwick as what he calls a forest bridge, where the only people on the bridge will be trees and humans, and this has now been approved. It has received its planning permit, and it will be built, which is really a sign of where people want to be in our big cities. This is a highway on the left-hand side in Hamburg with like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lanes of traffic. They're planning to cover the whole thing over with green and grow allotments on top of it. <laughs> and why not? In Vancouver, um, the neighbors are actually encouraged to grow plants and food on the boulevards. And then you get this sense of beauty and ownership when you wander around the streets there. This is, um, I believe, um, I can't honestly say where this is, but if, you, if you've been there, you'll recognize it. It was obviously four lanes of traffic. Now look at it. Look at the creativity that's gone into that. It restores it as a real people place. And again, the same coming up here, restoring life. This is um, bringing food back into our cities. So in Vancouver, um, this used to be a massive, great, big, empty, dead, concrete waste space. And then some people got together with, and set up, they worked with Michael Abelman from Salt Spring, who's a farmer, worked with people from the downtown east side, where there's a lot of homelessness, created soul, farmed, soul food farms, that are growing food in containers. And if the owner of the land comes along and says, I'm going to build on it, they can just carry the containers away and find another bit of empty land. We can do this on a vacant land everywhere in our cities. We can grow community gardens, likewise, on empty plots, even if it's only temporary. In our regular suburban plots, we can use our front gardens to grow food and start celebrating the diversity of nature through the food we want to eat. 
and enjoy it. It's, and all in every city in North America, young people are finding ways to grow food and reclaim the experience of food that every one of our ancestors, going back for up to 10,000 years, took for granted. So now here in Victoria, we see boulevards on occasions filled with vegetables. And it's all about supporting your local pharmacy, different understandings of what makes us healthy. Um, there are easy ways to grow food in our back gardens. Um, this is a, what's called a lasagna bed, where, where my wife Carolyn teaches people how to do this. She wrote the book, The Zero Mile Diet. You don't need to cut up the law. You just lay cardboard and leaf, leaf mulch and manure and compost and more cardboard on top of it, and then you plant straight into it. You can grow food in vertical up, up staircases and containers. You can have all sorts of creative ways of growing food. If you believe you haven't got space, you can find space to grow food. And looking into the future, who knows what's possible? I've shown that one already. That's another sense of the Green Boulevard then. And Bhutan has set itself to become the world's first 100% organic nation, where every single farm would be organic. So now imagine that we restore the tradition of farm villages in the future. Um, that we have a lot of, here in Vancouver Island, a lot of farmland doing nothing, simply growing hay for horses, for people who are wealthy enough to keep horses for hobbies. Not horses for work, just as a hobby, right? So we've got farmland sitting empty, but young people who really want to farm. So imagine that on any farm of more than 20 hectares, one hectare could be rezoned as a farm, community farm village on condition that the residents farm the land. And that's something that, you know, it's an initiative I'm trying to get organized. I have a slide share about that to make that happen. This is down at the Eden Project in Cornwall in England to show the creativity of when we grow vegetables and grow food in this kind of way. And a farm village can look like that. It can be hobbit land if you want it to be, or we're farming the land around us. Look at the density of land in those one, two, three, could be five units of housing there. Very minimal footprint on the land, but very large beauty print. It's the kind of place that a lot of us would love to live. And deep in our hearts, there's a longing to discover a sense of community and celebration that we know our ancestors had that we're not enjoying so much. When did you last go to a decent barn dance, for instance? It's about family, it's about community, it's honest hard work, and restoring harmony with nature. And it's about celebration. So, change of gear. What about transportation? We need to get around. Can we tr do transportation in total harmony with nature? For cars and light trucks, yes, it's possible. Right now, we're totally dependent on oil. And we're afraid of what's going to happen when the oil runs out, or some people are. I'm not, but some people are. So let's imagine we can start doing more of our trips for a start by walking. And the secret to that is making walking joyful so that we, we like to walk in these kind of communities. It's a pleasure to walk around, to hang around, to be out in public. To, and then we can do much more of our trips by cycling. In Holland, 40% of all their traffic movement is by bicycle. So, but the key to it is safe bike lanes that are separated from the traffic, like this in downtown Vancouver, or in downtown San Francisco. It's got to be safe enough that mothers feel safe to take their children out on their bikes without even need for a bike helmet, whether it's one child, two children, three children, one, two, three, four, five, six children, or even a grandmother with a grandchild. Peacefully, not in a rush, able to travel around the city. And then in, there are cities where we have bike sharing with, with, with community-owned bikes. You can take out. Paris started this. Now a lot of cities around the world have bike share programs. We have electric bicycles, whether it's the bionics system. So you come to a hill, you just switch on the electric drive, and the hill vanishes. Or if you're elderly and you feel you need more assistance with your muscles, you get fancy new electric bikes like this. You have fancy, even fancier electric bikes like this, which you can fold up and comes along with a, v, with a v Volkswagen car. And you can have the Copenhagen wheel, when you actually take off the back wheel and replace it with this new electric wheel that, that gathers energy while you're braking and also, I believe, can be plugged in to build up energy and turn the bike into an electric bike. That's the Copenhagen wheel. Just Google it and you'll find out. We can also use bicycles for much more of our downtown transport. You know, this is a friend of mine called Tony who builds Tony's trailers. And up in Duncan on Vancouver Island, they're running a business doing recycling for commercial businesses. Or 
running, you know, IKEA in Europe is instead of big trucks, you can get home delivery by bicycle for those bits of bookshelf you've got to assemble. Or if you want to, when you come to the end of life, you can go to your better place in heaven or wherever you want to be by bike. And with LEDs, who knows what is coming with, with the, the LED night bike, whatever you want to call it, fancy stuff is coming, even entire bike lanes that are luminescent at night through advanced materials. It's all coming to this new future. Transit. When we have a decent transit service, all those cars are no longer on the roads, spewing out carbon emissions, taking up space, being a problem. And so in Hassel, Belgium, they had a massive problem with overwhelming too much traffic. And they were going to build a new freeway. So they said, well, let's actually make an experiment. We'll make transit free. So in 20 years, no, in 10 years, from 1996, they had a 12-fold increase in ridership from 1,000 riders a day to 12,000 riders a day. They now charge a dollar per ride because it was costing them too much to, to give free transit to all those people. But they did not build the highway. They kept the quality of their town. And they got everyone trained in the habit of using the bus instead of using a car. It's possible everywhere. Imagine every bus stop has a real-time electronic timetable, so you know when the bus is coming. It's common throughout Europe. You hardly ever see it in North America. Bus shelters can also be creative, not just a single pole in the rain. Um, a lot of people are having fun with bus shelters. Why don't we give community associations the freedom to build local bus shelters and do stuff that's interesting, that makes us chunk and laugh? And the buses themselves can be 100% electric. Um, there are online electric buses here in South Korea and in Los Angeles. Um, in Stockholm, there are buses running on biogas that they gather out of their sewage treatment process. Again, not burning fossil fuels. When it comes to cars, you, instead, before we go to ownership, you can actually join a car share group. I helped found the Victoria Car Share Co-op. Coming up 20 years ago, we have um, 650 members sharing 23 vehicles instead of owning 650 cars. And the future of car sharing is peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. So thanks to the development of the software and the systems technology around car sharing, people can now put your own car into the pool and earn up to $300 a month from renting it out to your neighbors. So now car sharing can expand really rapidly because you don't need to buy new cars to put in the pool. Um, but on the street where you live, you'll find a car accessible, and that means you have fewer cars overall. It's generally beneficial. So then we come to electric vehicles running off 100% green electricity, which is also coming. This, I'm not sure which community this is. Um, I'm judging by the bus, it's San Somendo. It's probably in, in Spain or Portugal. Anyway, that little um, car, electric car, when you want to park it, it actually folds up. And the Renault Twizy electric vehicle is on the streets of Paris. It's a two-seater with a 100-kilometer range, but it's selling for $10,000. Um, with it, when they're paying with a monthly fee for the battery lease. So they're already running around, not available in North America yet, but look what's possible. The Nissan Leaf has got a 120-kilometer range, fully electric. The Smart Electric, 135-kilometer range. The Tesla, up to 400-kilometer range. Range is increasing, price is falling, battery recharging is improving. And if you look at the cost of running an electric car, if you're just um, doing, say, 10,000 kilometers a year, if you have a gas car, it's $130 a month. If you're running electric at $0.10 cents a kilowatt hour, it's $13 a month. If you're paying twice that, it's only $26 a month. It's way cheaper to run an electric vehicle. And everyone who has an electric car says they're never going back to gasoline, the same way that people who use an Apple say they're never going back to a PC. There's solar electric car charging on a major scale. There's an electric ferry that's coming on stream next year in, in Norway. Um, all electric. It'll take 120 cars, a 10-minute recharge for a 30-minute trip. The batteries weigh 400 tons, but the ferry itself is made of very lightweight materials that balances out the weight. If we can have a ferry that does a 30-minute trip in 2015, maybe by 2025, we've got a ferry that does an hour and a half, a 90-minute trip. And then we're beginning to see the possibility of, of ferries all around the world going electric. And because when we go to electric, we, we stop burning oil, we eliminate air pollution. And that's a great relief for people who suffer from asthma, um, lung disease, heart disease. Change of gear housing. Modern new houses, when they're designed like a passive house, use 90% less energy than a regular house. And this house, built in Victoria just last year by Robin Mark Bernhardt, um, had only cost 4% more than a regular house. 
and they're looking in a second house they're building right now to do it for the same cost as a conventional house while using 90% less heat. So the remaining heat can be met by an air source heat pump or even by baseboard heaters or as someone said even by a, um, a hot air fan to dry your hair with. So the And the monthly energy savings more than meet that tiny increased 4% extra cost or maybe no extra cost at all. And then we come to the solar revolution that's now you know, beginning to take off. There's been a hundred fold fall in the price of solar since 1977. Quite dramatic. It's caused by mass production in China and in South Korea. And we have a massive increase in uptake of China, uh, <laughs> uptake of solar PV around the world for that reason. And it's going to be quite normal now to see all new houses with south-facing roofs being built and looking like this, except they have vegetables growing in the front garden instead of just grass. This is the soccer stadium in Taiwan. That's all solar PV. And it's not just in the developed world. You know, around the world where villages like this would normally be burning kerosene for lighting, and kerosene is a fossil fuel, and you've got to pay for it every month, the same cost, or much less now, can buy a small solar panel that gives you lighting in the evening, a radio for television, for communications, for internet, and it's 100% renewable energy. Right now, um, a 4 kilowatt solar system, which costs you around $16,000 and generate 4,400 kilowatt hours a year in temperate regions of the world, maybe up to 5,000 down in the hot south. By 2020, according to KPMG, that could, price could be down to 6,000. And that now could be saving you $30,000 and more over the 25-year over the life of the panels, which is how long they're guaranteed for by the manufacturers. And actually, those panels are good for up to 50 years, only losing about 10% of their yield per annum. So this is the Inland Sea in Japan near Tokyo, a 70 megawatt floating solar plant. This is a new solar bridge across London. Actually, it's a railway bridge, just being covered in solar, because why not? It's, gonna, it's a place where you can earn money. India is building solar canals. I mean, that water in the canal evaporates in the heat of the summer. So why not build solar on top of it? This is the solar hot water system that my wife and I had on our house in Victoria. Um, this is an evacuated tube solar hot water system in Victoria. It's another way of gathering the sun's energy. This is, what, this is a hybrid system that gathers both solar voltaic and solar hot water energy at the same time, pioneered in Portugal. So when you look at the scale of solar energy in general, given that the tiny blue, sorry, that tiny brown circle on the left shows that the world energy use is 16 terawatt hours per year. It's um, terawatt years per year. And we're using, we're generating 23,000 terawatt years, terawatt Yes, terawatts. Yeah. On the right-hand side, you see how much energy is generated by wind every year, and then the total amount for coal, uranium, petroleum, and natural gas. So the sun is able to generate vastly more energy every year than we need for our purposes. It was fossil fuels that launched the industrial age and the modern world, so we shouldn't... We, there's no sense here that fossil fuels are wrong. Without fossil fuels, we could not have done the advanced engineering that makes the solar age possible. So the, source, the age of fossil fuels have really been the launch ramp for the solar age, because once we start the solar age, which is happening right now, the sun doesn't begin to turn into a red giant for more than a billion years. So for that long a period of time, solar technology is going to get improved and get cheaper every year. It's quite an amazing thought to realize how profound the transition that's underway on the planet right now is. We very rarely get a chance to look at things in the big picture. We're stuck in this month, this week, this year, and not the big picture. And it's really transformative. And the same applies for the wind energy revolution. Price of wind is falling around the planet. Um, and so wind is a very major, important source of energy for the future. Maybe in Japan they're designing these new form wind turbines that should have less noise and more efficiency because of that rim around the edge. Mark Jacobson from Stanford has done calculations with his students to show how we can get all the energy we need for electricity and transport and heating from just wind, water, and solar power by the year 2030, using hydrogen for long-distance transportation, using surplus renewable energy to split water. 70% of Canadians believe that it's possible. I'm pretty sure that similar numbers throughout the world. We know instinctively that the clean energy revolution is possible. We just don't understand why it's taking so long what's needed. So Germany has um, 
we've got more than half the nation, half the population already living in regions which are making the commitment to become a 100% renewable energy region. And we did a webinar with Beata Fisher in the, by the, you know, with the BCSEA earlier this year, which is online at our BCSEA website, and I'll give you the address for that later. As well as all this environmental and energy change, we're also moving from a capitalist to a cooperative economy. Now, that you might think, well, that's hard to believe, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Again, we need to believe that another world is possible because capitalism is not working. For most people, it is really causing more distress. In a cooperative economy, we still have private business, but those businesses cooperative, they flourish in harmony with other businesses, workers, and with community, and with nature, and with the world. So those businesses, those privately owned businesses, and cooperatively owned businesses, do so in a, they, they flourish in a cooperative manner. So we will get to close down the offshore tax havens, which are doing so much harm to the planet. We will get to establish public banks, where the, the state itself can set up a bank and create the credit we need to start new businesses and start enterprising the economy. And North Dakota has had a public bank since the 1930s, the only state in America that's done so. And they've had no public debt at all since the year 2001, the only state in America that has no public debt. We have a carbon tax to start taxing those externalities. Right now, instead of feeling free to pollute nature and trash nature, we need to tax for all forms of pollution and bring it back in. We can have a financial transaction tax to sort of start taking some of that massive amount of money that's pouring through the stock exchange and currency trading and bring it to useful social purposes while slowing down some of the craziness on Wall Street. We can, regular businesses are turning into benefit corporations where the legal requirement of the, the directors of that business are that they must, as well as bringing a return to their shareholders, they must also be a benefit to the community or the environment or to nature in some precise, precise organized way. We are seeing more, business, more women directors coming onto the board of companies. And here's the clear evidence that companies with more women board directors experience higher financial performance according to a recent report. So, and women are bringing a more harmonious cooperative style, which is why they're taking less risk and doing less crazy stuff. We see more green business certification. On Vancouver Island, there's a whole program called Vancouver Island Green Business Certification happening, which I have failed to get a slide up for. I apologize about that. But when businesses are certified, there's a level of trust that what they're producing is moving towards harmony with nature instead of abusing it and exploiting it. We also have the, the thought coming up that we need to change our whole approach to welfare and have a basic income for everyone. That's an income unconditionally guaranteed to everyone on an individual basis without means test or work requirement. It took Martin Luther King quite a while to come around to realizing that really that's what we need as a way to tackle the growing poverty, the struggle, the debt, the, the, the difficulties that people on lower incomes and younger people are going through. We can build a new economy through a sharing economy. So instead of everything being owned privately, we cooperate together in a sharing economy. Um, the book, that What's Mine is Yours, is full of details of how we're sharing tools, sharing cars, sharing houses, sharing all sorts of stuff. This is the neighborhood tool sharing library in Vancouver. Instead of having to own a ladder individually or own a big bit of power equipment, we can share it. We need youth enterprise initiatives to teach young people how to start businesses, how to start cooperatives so that we have an entrepreneurial state of mind while we're building a cooperative economy. It's quite the opposite of communism and orthodox old-fashioned socialism. We need to have microfinance for people on low income so they can get a loan when they need to, to get out there and start a business. It's already happening around the world. Oregon has found a solution to student debt, um, which was passed through the state legislature, which is going to be, it's called pay it forward. Um, so that when you've done your degree, you pay a small percentage of your income um, one or two percent every year for 25 years. So if you're earning, pay, uh, working McDonald's, you give one or two percent of McDonald's income to pay it down. If you're, if you're working on Wall Street, give one or two percent of your billions. It's a very fair system. And basically, if you think you're crazy enough to change the world, then please be my guest. Get out there and help us do this sort of stuff. And sit down and make a plan. How are we going to do this? What skills do you need to do it? It's really very straightforward. You need passion. You need commitment. You need research, learning, thinking, asking questions, practical experience, dig in. And then we need to do stuff because it's when we work, we learn from our mistakes, we improve our skills, our hands get better, our brains get better, our legs get better. We learn, we become experts in this sort of stuff. We need teamwork so that we're working together and learning the skills of working as a team 
and we need persistence. So when we get a difficulty and fall over, we're still able to pick ourselves up. There's nothing that I admire more than persistence because it means we're still there 30, 40, 50 years later. And finally, we need faith and just that belief that we can create utopia and we do not have to surrender to apocalyptic thinking. How do we make it happen? Very simply, it's really all about community engagement, getting other people involved as well. We don't need to do this on our own. And especially getting young people involved, because it's young people who are most vulnerable to apocalyptic thinking, plus a bunch of people in their late 50s and 60s who have given up on life, which is embarrassing to me because that's my generation. Um, it's young people who need to believe that they can make this world a powerfully different, better place. So everyone has to voting. Voting is really important. Let's reduce the voting age to 16. Let's get transferable voting at City Hall and everywhere else. And let's have a $200 tax credit when you vote. So if you don't vote, you lose your tax credit. We need to do whatever we can to get people voting. Hold meetings when we can design the future. How do we think differently? How do we make a different future? All these ideas I put out there, let's put them into practice in our neighborhood, in our city, in our state. A green sustainable future is not an option. It's really an urgent necessity because of those crises of climate change, because of the crisis in the ocean and the forests, because of the financial crisis, we've got to do this. So on the one hand, for the older folks, I say keep calm and change the world. But you might think, um, oh, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Yeah. Um, my friend Joseph Boutillier, another youngster, he, he has now finished this trip. He got on a unicycle and cycled all the way across Canada from Victoria to Ottawa to spread awareness about climate change. We've got a lot of good media coverage. These people in Code Pink, um, they're actively out campaigning around the world for all sorts of human rights issues. Um, the truth will set you free, they say, but first it will piss you off because you're angry, you know that you've got to make a difference in the world. So we need courage. We need outrageous courage. We need getting out there, making a difference. That's um, one of the nine books I've put together on the solutions to global warming. This is a book I'm just finishing on the vision of the future that will hopefully be coming out later this fall. And this whole presentation is on SlideShare. If you just go to slideshare.net and then my name, it's about us, our planet, and our future. Frankly, this is our home. It's about metamorphosis. It's, I, I'm repeating myself. A better world is possible. Keep calm and change the world. Alternatively, no thanks. I'd rather raise hell and change the world. It's like, go for it. Go for it. Because unless someone like you cares an awful lot, nothing is going to get better. Nothing's going to change. We'll just be seeing those clear cuts. And it's small groups of thought for committed people who make a difference. They, they, they're the, that's what happened to end slavery. That's what happened to win the votes for women. That's what happened to form the forced labor unions. That's what happened to win civil rights around the world. That's what's happening today to end child slavery around the world. So we need to go into the deepest part of our souls and find out what I really want for my life and for our planet and make it happen. And don't be shy of integrating our spiritual lives, our emotional lives, our mental lives, and our physical lives. Then we can really enjoy living because if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. And once again, I apologize for the repetition, but it's worth it every day. There's our planet. And if you want to make a difference, now would be a great time to do so. Please don't leave it till it's too late. Let's transform this world and make a beautiful place out of it, as we know we can. Nature's doing it already. That's Mount Baker, the view from Victoria, my friend, Britt Swerveland. We just need to do it now. So now, the same question I gave you at the beginning. When you think about the future of world, what do you feel? I don't know how you're responding. This is a YouTube video, so you can write in the, in the boxes and, and just share your thoughts about this video. So encourage other people, if you like it, tell them about it. How has it changed your thinking? Or maybe it hasn't, maybe it has. I don't know, because I'm just sitting in my office giving this talk. A lot of my work you'll find at the BCSEA website, um, bcsea.org, and at my personal website, earthfuture.com. If you follow me this long, thank you for your patience, and I wish you every strength and courage in changing the world, and joining me in changing the world. Thanks very much.